uh, I feel very honored to, to be here, to be invited, and I uh, want to thank the EST for the work it has done in the last 20 years and congratulate to her birthday. <laughs> Uh, happy birthday, Est. And I want to thank the organizers, Michael Boyden, uh, the Center for Translation Studies, Larissa Schippel, and uh, the Est, of course, uh, in uh, the, uh, not only in the figure of the president, uh, Anthony Pym, but uh, to her, all who have worked all these years on promoting translation studies research. What I will try to do today is uh, to present uh, an attempt. It, it is Actually, in, in, in this initial stage, I just uh, try to work out an idea uh, which might be able, uh, which might make us uh, make it possible for us to uh, apply it to different levels of translation, to the object level, to the discourse level, and so on. And it seems to be uh, a central aspect of how we deal with translation and how we conceptualize translation. But there seems to be also something, it's not only constructed, there seems to, there seems to be something in the mechanisms of translation that also forces to think this way. Uh, so I will talk about what I call the instrumental dispositive. One constitutive trait of translation is its instrumental nature, and uh, the functionalist uh, people have shown this uh, in their work. It is instrumental in the sense that it functions as a medium which takes a back seat in order to serve the superordinate communication aim. When an instruction manual is translated, the main function of the text is to provide assistance for getting to the machine to work. The translation of a recipe generally serves to cook a dish the translation of a legal text is generally used for legal practice, and there are very few readers of literature who will read a translated novel because it is a translation. In all these cases, translation fulfills the communication aim without necessarily foregrounding its nature as translation, as a translation. The dominant nature of translation's instrumental character becomes clearer when we think of translations which might be called deficient from a semantic or grammatical point of view, but still fulfill their function. This is how Google Translate perfectly fulfills its function. Correctness or accuracy becomes irrelevant. The point I want to put across is that one major implication of the instrumental aspect is that in order for it to be effective, the process of translation tends to or has to be forgotten. That is, translation in the act of execution, in a sense, negates itself. Translation studies shares the, its instrumental, translation, sorry, shares its instrumental character with other phenomena or concepts. Medium is one such concept, although one can hardly speak of medium as a single concept. The medium, like translation, is regarded as functioning best when it dissolves itself, when it becomes invisible while undertaking its task as messenger. An example would be air. We don't realize that air functions as medium as long as we are able to see and hear through it, just as we ignore most physical conditions of perception which aren't relevant in a given situation. It is only when we have problems hearing or seeing, that is, when the medial transparency is disturbed, for example, when there is fog or a wall, where we direct our attention to the physical conditions and their medial character. Transparency, therefore, always operates against the background of the possibility of fitness. And I think we have not uh, looked into the relation of the two uh, in, enough, and it's an ambivalent relation. It's, an, it's a relation of a double bind, as, as Derrida would say. Um, when I say opaqueness, I also include the conspicuousness that arises when an instrument is misused. That is, when it does not fulfill the function commonly attributed to it, such as when a saucepan is used as a musical instrument. Lavinia Heller, a colleague in Gamma Sam, has formidably theorized on the issue of translation becoming conspicuous within the framework of Heideggerian pragmatics in her PhD thesis, and it's an excellent thesis which is going to be published soon. Uh, the instrumental character and uh, this ambivalent relation 
I've mentioned between transparency and opaqueness, um, I have the feeling leads to a certain kind of approach towards translation as well, and it lends itself to manipulation too. To give an example of how we could study the mechanisms of the instrumental, we could take a look at the field of legal interpreting. The special conditions and setting of a trial, as well as its reliance on oral communication, where I quote the linguistic justice theoretician uh, Rubio Marin, where linguistic acts that take place are taken to provide evidence of the highest relevance to determining the outcome, end of quote, justify the special status of legal translation and interpretation to a certain extent, of legal interpretation to a certain extent. Rubio Marin speaks of translation and interpretation as belonging to the sphere of instrumental language rights. In the context of legal interpreting, translation, uh, sorry, interpretation seems vital indeed. However, as in many approaches to translation and interpretation, here too, it is not a very welcome guest. Again, there is ambivalence which derives from the necessity of translation as an instrument to work, to function as an instrument, and it's being realized as a factor of disturbance. I quote Rubio Marin, relying on a translator can be only a second best option as it deprives the judicial process of some of its purity, she says. Let us take a brief look at an example from ECHR case law. In the case of Prototapa uh, versus Turkey from 2009, the applicant's complaints centered around the quality of interpretation. She says that the interpretation was not good enough to provide the necessary information for her to understand the accusations and react accordingly. According to Article 6 of the Convention, the appointment of an interpreter as such does not guarantee access to a fair trial. Yet the concept of quality remains unclear, and I wonder whether the new directive on the rights to interpretation and translation in criminal proceedings, where the issue of quality is addressed, will provide remedy. In this case, the court stated that, I quote, even if the court has no information on which to assess the quality of the interpretation provided, it observes that it is apparent from the applicant's own version of the events that she understood the charges against her and the statements made by the witnesses at the trial. In any event, it does not appear that she challenged the quality of the interpretation before the trial judge, requested the replacement of the interpreter, or asked for clarification concerning the nature and cause of the accusation. That is, she has rights, but she doesn't know how to use rights. The discourse in this example is on translation. The court displays an ultimately instrumental approach, I would say, when it is only interested in the general function. Did the accused person roughly understand the accusation? The court is not interested in the details of the interpretation, and it doesn't have the chance to assess the quality of interpretation after all. But it does remind the applicant of her right to request a replacement or ask for clarification. That is, the court expects the applicant to be aware or to have a high awareness about translation processes and uh, about what uh, translation quality means. That there was interpretation and that it was instrumental in fulfilling the basic function in that situation means that the requirement of the instrumental language rights are met at large for the court. But how could the applicant have controlled the quality of the interpreter or, than by, uh, or, or that by, other than, sorry, other than by major disturbances in the flow of communication. She resorts to the argument of economy, saying that, quote, the interpretation into Greek did not cover all the words used by the witnesses and the parties, end of quote. She adds that the interpreter interrupted the others constantly. These are the disturbances of the instrumental character which cause suspicion. But the disturbance could also be a striking accent of the interpreter, non-idiomatic language use, and so on. Not always justifiable reasons for the lack of quality. And the arguments show, of course, that it is the ideal of a model of pure communication, a conduit metaphorical model of translation that is effective here. The duplicity of the dimensions of transparency and opaqueness should be central for a critical epistemology of the media 
says the uh, media theorist uh, Sibylle Kremer. And I think that this ambivalence at the heart of the instrumental dispositive is crucial for our reflection on translation, its actors, and discourses too. I borrow the term dispositive from Michel Foucault. He uses it in his study on the history of sexuality as a methodological tool which makes it possible to analyze the relations between knowledge, power, and subjectivity. Speaking of a dispositive, it has been also in, um, translated as apparatus or uh, procedures, processes, and there is a whole discussion about the translation of the word, uh, but I use dispositive. Speaking of a dispositive implies that we have to look into how this network is constructed and how its different elements interact, how they are shaped by power strategies, how they are linked to institutions, and so on. The elements, Foucault suggests, mutually reinforce or destabilize each other. Using dispositive as a methodological tool also requires that we reflect on its normative function, on how it operates in a regulatory way, and on the conditions which make it possible. I want to suggest the concept of instrumental dispositive for a methodology to analyze the link between the object, the discourse, and the institutions which determine what translation is. I have cited quite a, few, a lot of evidence from the social practice of translation which seems to impose the instrumental view and we seem to be the, in the middle of the discourse here. If there is an instrumental dispositive, it will have a normative function and it will not only affect how translation is used but also how it is talked about and how its institutions are shaped. This leads us on to the discourse level. The concept of instrumental reason assumes a central position in Horkheimer and Adorno's critique of enlightenment. The di dialectic of enlightenment, which was published in 1944, documents the rise of instrumental reason, which Horkheimer and Adorno regard as a major condition for the political catastrophes of their age. Three years later, Eclipse of Reason appeared, where Horkheimer again focuses on instrumental reason. The German translation is Kritik der Instrumentellen Vernunft. I will briefly touch upon the main arguments of this criticism to see what we can gain from the Frankfurt philosophers. For Horkheimer and Adorno, enlightenment has done away with the idea of objective reason, dogmatism and superstition, and replaced it with subjective reason, which in time turns into instrumental reason. When science replaces ideals and concepts of rationalist metaphysics, which assumed a universal human, the human content gets lost, says Horkheimer. Science becomes the ultimate authority in society, but its aims are reduced to classifying facts and calculating possibilities, probabilities. For Horkheimer, subjective reason and the formalization of philosophy and science are closely related. The rise of subjective reason and positivism in science and scientism in society go hand in hand. He speaks of an intellectual economy to refer to the mechanization which is essential for the expansion of industry, but if it becomes characteristic, a characteristic feature of minds, and if reason itself turns into an instrument, it, I quote Horkheimer, it takes on a kind of materiality and blindness, becomes a fetish, a magic entity that is accepted rather than intellectually experienced, end of quote. If reason is deprived of its content in this way, it easily lends itself to ideological manipulation. Subjective reason for Horkheimer conforms to everything. It may be used by the adversaries as well as by the defenders of the traditional humanitarian values, and he gives examples from intellectuals in the United States arguing that slavery is not unjust. We might not entirely agree with Horkheimer and Adorno's analysis, and the analysis have to be put in, in context, into the historical and social context, of course, um, but uh, some of their ideas, I think, are very pertinent to our time and certainly worth remembering. The critique of instrumental reason draws our attention to the need to switch the focus from only optimizing the means, but instead to reflecting on what is often, often taken for granted, question the aims, that is the so-called final aims, the superordinate aims. They remind us of a historical and social role we take when we do science or philosophy. 
Instrumental reasoning here becomes a critical category of thought and a possibility for the analysis of discourses, academic and institutional practices. It seems to me that we need more of such thinking and translation studies where the instrumentalist positive has widely determined the outlook of our research and our institutions. As translation is considered instrumental in that it serves a superordinate communication aim, research on translation is influenced by instrumental reasoning, which obscures the view of the super, superordinate aims we serve. One indication of the instrumental dispositive may be practice orientation as a guiding principle and as a legitimate ground for research and teaching, or the only legitimate ground for research and teaching. Another indication can be found when looking at research in the field of translation technologies where disparity is observed between instrumentally oriented and critical research. The first is characterized by mostly application oriented studies and the latter would be critical theoretical studies on the effects of these technologies, their social and political implications as well as the analysis of their history in the Foucauldian sense, its conditions and connections with other developments in society, its relation to power and ideology. What are the effects of the instrumental dispositive more specifically for translation studies practice? Let me take one concept from the network as an example which is very commonly used and rarely looked at critically, the concept of competence. The career which the notion of competence has made in EU countries in the last decades is impressive. There are a huge number of research projects and publications focusing on this concept in many different fields. When we browse the field of translation pedagogy, we will find numerous publications which define translation competence, which work with it in a more general pedagogical framework, or which develop models to be applied in translator training. But we will seldom find critical studies on the concept, its development, and its implications. Translation studies have indeed created an inflationary amount of sub-competencies to segment, organize, and assess translation competence. Remember Horkheimer's critique of instrumental reason, reason classifying and calculating probabilities. Anthony Pym therefore called for a minimalist approach in a paper which was published back in 2003. A minimalist approach, he says, can sustain a critical approach to those tasks and technologies that do indeed mistake means for ends. According to Pym, the technologies make us forget that our basic task has to do with communication between humans and that the manipulation of electronic mediation should serve this purpose. While a minimalist co co concept of competence should make us aware of the ends of our work, a multi-component model does not critically separate means from ends, and I quote Pym, and that, with all due respect and comprehension, is a recipe for perdition. The problem, however, seems to lie not only in the multi-component model, but in the very concept of competence itself. The concept of competence was fostered by the European Commission, which put forward the central ideas and the strategy for its implementation in EU societies and the necessary funding for research. The sociologist Ingrid Drexel, who has specialized in the societal structuring of occupations and skill formation, lists some traits of the competence concept which she observes despite the great varieties of uses which depend on the scientific and political stance of the author. Here is a summary of these common aspects and of the possible consequences which Drexel mentions in her analysis. First, as opposed to the qualification concept which designates societally organized and regulated learning processes as we have them in universities, the competence concept focuses on the output. Learning here is understood in a very broad sense and, and informal learning receives specific attention. Second, dissociating the qualification from the formal learning process makes it necessary to have, I quote Drexel, procedures for identifying and assessing the results of the learning process. Um, all kinds of competences are assessed and certified. According to Drexel, this may lead to a marginalization of public or semi-public diplomas and a decrease in the responsibility of the state and companies for organized learning processes. Money would be used for competence assessment procedures. If diplomas have less value, it becomes difficult to retain unifying standards also in terms of income 
they will be substituted by individual or company-specific wage bargaining. Three, while devaluating formalized qualification, the competence concept favors experience and gives the immediate operability of workforce competences a special status. Four, the concept also includes personal values, motivations, and behavior. Five, the concept brings about the individualization and fragmentation of learning results, thereby creating more and more atomistic, narrowly cut competences, as opposed to the holistic qualification concept of the 60s and 70s. It is envisaged that these atomistic competences, along with a high level of flexibility, replace the traditional structure of workflow categories with patchwork profiles. As the competence combinations will be very specific and individual, horizontal mobility will be more difficult, and the ties between the worker and his or her company will be stronger, unilaterally stronger, of course. And as the competence concept not only includes skills, and formal or informal knowledge, but also values, norms, and motivations, it becomes easier to recruit workers according to political criteria and to cover, for, uh, to cover forms of repression. I think that it becomes clear that there is a political background to the success story of the competence concept. Drexel argues for the necessity of critical research which can influence the future of the concept but she also notes that, for example, in Germany, the critical, the critical tradition in sociology has suffered under EC funding politics. Translation studies fits into this backdrop and the competence concept which we use, accompanied by our new modular curricula and our slenderized BA and MA programs, which are nice, um, in the spirit of Bologna, is precisely producing the profiles Drexel describes. Theory and critical thinking are marginalized in favor of practice orientation and applicability. I don't think, of course, that we would do our students a favor if we didn't prepare them for the market. But what does adequate preparation look like? Maybe we should have more basic discussions on this. And now for some final material to hopefully provoke a bit of thought. It seems almost impossible to consider the learning pro process without the concept of competence and without certain ideas about translation petrified in designations like transfer competence. In a paper entitled What is Translation Competence, published in 2009, Kirsten Malmkjær uses the category transfer competence first and then adds that, I quote, there is one problem left with the description of transfer competence though, namely the use of the transfer metaphor. As I understand meaning, meaning is generated anew in each speech encounter so that there is nothing in fact to transfer." End of quote. Oh yes, we have taken quite a few steps towards problematizing essentialist concepts of translation and translation studies. Why then do we stick to concepts like transfer competence? More than likely because the concept of competence requires atomistic segments which are controllable and accessible, how could a more holistic approach fit into such a tight straitjacket? It is difficult to look behind the discourse which imposes upon us what Durbin, who, uses, um, who has written on the concept of intercultural competence, what Durbin calls prêt à penser, ready to think, concepts ready to think. But thinking should not be like fast food. Self-reflection, as uh, Michaela Wolf has told us, is crucial. Slowing down and dissecting might also act as a counterbalance. One major topic in, in, the critique of enlightenment according, in a critique of enlightenment, according to Adorno and Derrida, should be the relation between the concept of subject and the concept of success. Enlightenment subjectivity is conceptualized as a normative power of succeeding, that is a certitude that a self-present subject can make his or her deeds succeed. Criticism of enlightenment for Adorno and Derrida means criticizing, deconstructing the idea of the subject. The subject does not have the power to make or his, her acts succeed. Uh, rather, there is a difference, a gap between a subject's ideal, aim, intention, and the act of succeeding. There is an unmistakable difference between being capable of something and actually achieving success. Maybe we should rethink competence in this light. <laughs>
The difference Derrida means is not only a difference between me and the other, the one who writes a letter and the one who reads it, or between the context, but it is a difference within the subject. I don't have control over the success of my acts. Practically speaking, and Derrida makes this clear, we have to act believing that we will succeed. But this is a belief, a metaphysical presumption, as he says, which Adorno calls hope. When we act, we always believe that we will succeed, otherwise we couldn't be able to act, but this makes us forget the difference between the two. We need quite a bit of luck when it comes to the conditions of being successful, conditions we cannot control. In Christoph Menke's analysis, both philosophers agree that an accurate praxis is the one which realizes the difference between being capable and succeeding, and operates in this difference. This has, uh, of course, implications also for concepts such as intentionality, causality, teleology, or agency, which are very central and basic concepts for translation studies. Let me conclude briefly uh, uh, conclude by briefly recalling some of the concepts or keywords I have used and offering them as fragments which could serve for a methodology of research, for reflecting on the politics of our discipline, and for adopting an alternative teaching approach. There was the instrumental dispositive, serving as a network of relations between objects, means, and discourses, and drawing our attention to the power issue. Discourses on translation and interpreting practices, tra translation and translation and interpreting practices can be analyzed with the help of such a methodological tool. We also looked at ambivalence, which you may also call the double bind between transparency and vagueness, which followed from conceptualizing translation in the instrumental way. Ambivalence seems to work well as a category of analysis, as shown in the work of Shebnam Bahadur, who borrows it from Sigmund Baumann. Hers is a new approach to studying and teaching interpreting without assuming a super control as implied by the Enlightenment concept, concept of subjectivity. Then there was the concept of instrumental reason as used by Horkheimer and Adorno, which provides us with a socio-philosophical framework for looking at the ends and not getting lost in the means. And finally, the term difference came up in an attempt to situate Derrida and Horkheimer as possible adversaries of the concept of competence. Drawing attention to the instrumental dispositive, helping to develop political consciousness, encouraging students to reflect upon the relationship between the means and the ends, and providing them with inspiring material for this would be a positive development in translator training institutions. And for the scientific community, too, it would be refreshing to be careful when we ask for more praxis orientation, when we don't let the pragmatic instrumental argument always win, and when we would celebrate, for example, languages uh, in a way, in, in different ways, for example, by also listening to languages we don't understand in a conference, because let's not forget that translation, after all, is a figure of difference and should celebrate difference. Thank you for listening.